Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to London DevOps. We're at meetup number 61. Um, we've been going since 2014 now. Um, so we're at about our seventh anniversary. Um, thank you to those past and present who have uh, attended previous meetups and are here again. Um, if you're new and you're hearing lots of people um, talking to each other who obviously know each other and thinking you've joined um, uh, a bit of a private club, then um, yes, you're right. It is a bit of a private club and we would love to have you in it. Um, likewise, for all us old hands, it's great to see you here as well. Um, so yeah, meetup number 2021, um, hashtag not run by Domi, as I believe she like, prefers to be called these days. Um, so we are here to talk about DevOps. Um, if you've been doing DevOps as long as I have, then you've probably heard 17,000 different definitions of what DevOps is. Um, here's one of my favorites um, uh, from Ken McGradgy at ThoughtWakes, who, who considers that DevOps is a culture where people, regardless of title or background, um, work together to imagine, develop, deploy and operate a system. Good definition of DevOps. Um, DevOps about culture. Um, it's as much about culture as it is about tools from Mandy Walls, um, who was on from Page of Duty talking in this very meetup last month, month before, was it? I can't remember. One of the two. Brilliant talk, whenever it was. Two months ago. Two months ago. Thank you, Mark. Um, and here's another definition from uh, John Vincent, um, uh, which is around, I've actually paraphrased it because it was a little bit rude before. Um, DevOps means caring about your job enough to not pass the buck. Um, DevOps means caring about your job enough to want to learn all the arts and not just your little bit of it. All the bits to the left and to the right of what you're doing. To a lot of people, DevOps also means this sort of thing, infinity loops, um, which yes, I still believe in, uh, many, many years in and lots and lots of tools. Um, we have a large um, contingent of our membership um, are all about the tools and love the tools, love doing excellent things about uh, with tools um, and getting people delivering things and uh, software flowing through your organization better through tools. And that's all good too. So that's DevOps or yet another definition of it. Um, and this is London DevOps. So traditionally we've, we've met inside of zone one in London uh, once a month or so. Um, we've gone to so many brilliant venues um, I won't start to list them out, um, but yes, we all, we're all missing not being in those venues. Um, still too soon for us to go back to that. Um, if not just because we're in a venue, but the opportunities for networking and talking, um, building new relationships, um, and uh, and also to you know enjoy some hospitality from um, those people who want to uh, raise their profile in terms of uh, um, organisations. Um, we, we miss all that. But this is what we're fundamentally here for, um, sharing knowledge, meeting new people, helping each other out. Um, and um, we um, run on some variation of Chatham House rules, which is that everything is shareable unless is, that's indicated otherwise. Um, so if you're going to say something you don't want to be shared or people to, to know about, then please, um, well, please either don't say it or ask for it not to be shared. Um, so yeah, we're online. Um, this is so 61. We started about number 51. So by my maths uh 51 was the first one we did online so it's the 11th one we've done online um yeah i'm not going to lie it's not quite the same experience um we've tinkered with the format a little um but we've we've managed to retain retain an audience people are still attending and enjoying the meetups so so that's great give it another few months and we'll be back in those venues so um everything we, we're doing is is recorded um it's on our our youtube channel um you'll find uh most of the meetups going back to 2014. Um, we did the very first one with, um, I think it was, with, might be my, my camcorder that I used to use when I took my girls on holiday to the beach. Um, and then we migrated up through Mark doing it with um, his um, much more professional setup. Um, now on Zoom, obviously I just hit record and it's there. So yeah, we'll have, um, we'll have the meetup recording up um, PDQ after the meetup. Here's our code of conduct. I'll just leave that on the screen um, for a moment for everyone to, to, to digest. Um, again, the code of conduct is it's not just a token thing. It's something we do believe in and have had to enforce um, in the past. Not expecting to tonight, but um, it's still um, absolutely valid. And I'm going to shut up now and let you read it.
So on to the organisers. Um, this is us. Um, so uh, four of us have been doing this pretty much since uh, 2014 um, together. It's a, it's a nice balance. Um, if um, rather undiverse, which is something I'm still uh, constantly annoyed by. Um, if you want to help us fix that, then please let me know. Um, but anyway, enough of dissing us white males, old white males as it, as it is. Um, just like to introduce you to Mark. Hello, Mark, do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. And I said, uh, welcome. I count as a minority because I'm a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. He's not from London. I think it might be from Croydon or somewhere further south. Um, and there's me. Um, so yeah, my name's Matt. Um, I uh, run DevOps at Adaptivist. I'll talk about them a bit more in a, in a minute. Jack, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending tonight. Hope everyone's been keeping well over the last year. I look forward to seeing everyone in the in-person events again. Especially you, Mr. Hardy. <laughs> and finally, Alex. Um, Alex, do you want to say hello? Hi, guys. Good to see everybody. Welcome to London DevOps. Thank you. All right, so um, there's a hashtag. Um, it doesn't get too much use, um, but um, yeah, we'd like it if you put some some tweets out about what you what you, what you see, um, the discussion points that we have um, up on the on the twitters. So hashtag London DevOps. So um, we can't really do this without sponsors. Um, so we will just talk through the sponsors just very very quickly. Um, starting off with Prism Digital. Over to you, Alex. Yes, so we're a DevOps and cloud talent partner. So uh, if you're looking for a job or if you're looking to hire in the DevOps space, give me a shout. Mercifully brief, thank you. Uh, moving on to um, Adaptivist. So I work for Adaptivist, I'm head of DevOps there. So I'm doing lots of cloud engineering um, and dealing with some of the uh, technology scaling challenges we have in a, in a business that um, is now 450 people, um, which is rather scary. Um, yeah, so primarily an Atlassian partner. So if you're doing anything with Jira, Confluence, any of those things, um, give us a bell. Um, and also lots of other stuff going into partnerships with people like Slack and GitLab, um, to name a few. Uh, and doing lots of cool DevOps stuff for our customers as well. I'll shut up now. Uh, Jack, do you want to talk about WeShape? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, so yeah, WeShape, we're a technology consultancy focusing in the DevOps and cloud native space. Um, so just a quick hello from us. Uh, if you are looking for a DevOps contract or, or a permanent position, we're, we're hiring. So yeah, give me a shout if you, if you want to have a chat. Cheers, Matt. Thanks, Jack. And finally, we're joined by, uh, by Tyke tonight. Um, is there anyone on the line from Tyke? No? Okay, well, I'll just do a quick introduction. So um, Tyke have joined us um, as a Platinum sponsor. Um, very, very, uh, very, very glad to have them on board. Um, go and look up their sites. Um, uh, it's right there, tyke.io, to find out a bit more about what they do. Um, very interested in the DevOps space and, and uh, how we can help them um, a little. Um, and yes, they'll be helping us uh, going forward as well. So um, we used to have a big section um, in the introduction about all the meetups and conferences that were going on um, in the olden days. Um, that kind of fell by the wayside um, when we went um, into lockdowns um, because, well, meetups weren't happening so much. And if they were, they were online. Um, it, it's a, maybe a bit of a failing that we hadn't kept that up because meetups were still going. I mean, we were still doing our meetups. Um, and also conferences still happen when we using technology like Zoom and uh, all the other things you can use to do this, um, they're still happening. So, you know, we're kind of having a little bit of a reintroduction of the conferences section, at least. Um, so going on quite soon, um, oh, whoops, sorry, type.io, thank you, David. Um, there's, um, this is relevant because of the, so the topic that we've got tonight. We're, we're basically themed around SRE, so uh, Site Reliability Engineering. Um, the guys, uh, sorry, the people at um, Container Solutions, um, just headed up by Jamie Dobson, um, and uh, various people like alumni such as Ian Mile, who I know a lot of you know, work there. Um, they're doing a, a WTF is SRE virtual conference uh, next Thursday. Um, so if you want to if you're interested in that, go and sign that up. Sign up for that. Um, you, you've got some good heavy hitters like uh, Lizzie's Rice and Liz Fong Jones um, talking at that. Um, catch a URL, www.cloud-native-sre.wtf, which I never knew was a, tier, a top level domain, but I do now. Fantastic. Um, and secondly, um, we've got um, 
we've got Ari from uh, JFrog is going to talk about um, Swamp Up. Are you there, Ari? I am. Hey, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ari Waller, and I'm the Meetup Event Manager for JFrog. And I really appreciate Matt and the team allowing me to make a quick announcement about our upcoming global DevOps conference, Swamp Up 2021. Uh, for those who may not know, JFrog is a DevOps software company. We were founded in 2008. Many people in the DevOps community know us best by our flagship product, Artifactory. So if you haven't heard of JFrog, you may have heard of Artifactory. Uh, so Swamp Up 2021 is coming to EMEA uh, June 1st through 3rd, and JFrog wants your meetup to get in for free. Um, as you can see from the slide, we will have some amazing DevOps uh, CEO guests and a CEO panel, uh, which is going to include the CEOs of HashiCorp, PagerDuty, Datadog, Elastic, and of JFrog. And of course, it wouldn't be the same without Alan Schimmel. So uh, he'll be joining them as well. Um, some of the breakout sessions that you'll see are uh, from people like Alyssa Miller, uh, Business Information Security Officer from SMP Global Ratings, uh, Stephen Randolph, Chief Architect from Real Methods. Sasha Rosenbaum, Senior Manager from Red Hat, and I'm sure many other names um, that uh, you will be able to um, see as well. Also, what's really cool is you'll have an opportunity to, uh, even at a virtual conference, come home for, with a t-shirt as well. So for attendees, we'll tell you once you get there how you can obtain one of these uh, shirts. Um, don't know if it's going to be this specific one, but this is our JFrog X-Ray t-shirt. And, and if uh, you know, you're not, if you don't want to dissect the frog, this is another way to, uh, to, ha to, to have one with you. Um, but again, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. And what I'll do is you can scan the QR code here, but I'll just also drop the link in the chat as well. And we hope to see you all at uh, Swamp Up 2021. Thanks, Matt. Beautiful. Thank you, Ari. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, Let's uh, go to the agenda. So we've got Sal uh, from Reliably. He's going to be talking um, about uh, from DevOps to SRE in the cloud. Um, so hopefully a, a nice gentle introduction to SRE for those of us um, who um, who don't know too much about it, um, but how to do it well in the cloud. Um, and then we'll follow that with um, an all about SRE panel session. So we've got some people on the line who will be um, uh, doing the panel session. So um, collect questions as, as they come to you during the um, uh, during Sal's talk. Um, if um, if you're all right with that, Sal, then after your talk, we'll have a, a brief Q&A. Um, and then after that, um, yeah, we'll do the panel. And so we'll, we'll open some of those questions up to, uh, to a wider audience, to a wider panel. And we encourage everyone to open up your cameras, come off mute um, and participate in that. Um, that's it for as far as the introduction goes. Um, so please do tell us what you think, uh, either by the meetup page, uh, find us on Twitter, um, or, or some of those good old fashioned electronic mails to org at London DevOps Co UK. Um, interested in hearing about um, uh, if you've got a story to tell, um, if you want to be a speaker at the meetup or a panelist. Um, also, if you're in a position to be able to host uh, the meetup um, when the when the world opens up again and when we're we're, we're happy with uh, going into um, going into, uh, into into offices in the center of town, that'd be great to hear from you. And anything else you want to talk about, um, if you um, comments on um, how the meetup is structured or ways to make it better, any, anything like that, then please please do let us know. Um, we don't get too much feedback, which um, leaves us wondering if we're doing the right thing, which we think we're doing the right thing, um, but it's always good to, um, um, to hear that we are um, and good to know how to improve if we're not. All right, I will shut up now um, and I'm gonna stop my share. Um, I'm going to pass it over to um, to Sal um, to to talk about SRE. Um, if you're able to share and um, get the show in the road, that'd be great. Cool, Thanks, everyone. Um, all right, hi everybody. Uh, Sal, um, I do have just a quick question as I'm getting this set up. If you can let me know in the comments uh, what your job title is, particularly if you are an SRE, I just want to get an idea of how much I am quote unquote speaking to the choir. Um, but uh, I do assume that if you're here to sort of understand a little bit about SRE in the cloud, this is uh, going to be a little bit of a higher level talk. I'm going to talk about some tools that you can use, but I really want you to understand that some of these practices and these best practices can be put in place with what you already have. Um, so let's get started. 
So this is what we're going to cover today, and I promise you I can do this in 30 minutes or less, probably much less. I know that because I gave this exact talk at HashiTalk Africa this morning at 10 a.m. <laughs> so uh, I was, uh, I mean, I'm excited to get back into rooms with people, but it's also really cool. I uh, just got to talk about SRE to a room like full of entrepreneurs in Africa today, and I, I think it's cool that everyone's really becoming so interested in this topic because it's important. Um, we're going to start with SRE. What exactly is it? What do I mean when I'm talking about monitoring versus observability? Um, who are SREs in the wild? Uh, what do you look for in their skill set and what they're doing and how do you improve them and upskill them? Uh, we're going to go into information silos uh, in both code and in time and how SRE really helps to combat that. Um, and then a little bit of a how to. Uh, I'm going to show you how you can automate your SLIs and your SLOs in like five minutes or less. So I hope you will enjoy that. So the first step is understanding SRE. If you are not one, um, you probably have heard this definition at least. Um, defining site reliability engineering as what happens when software engineer is tasked with what used to be called uh, operations. But it's becoming more complex, and as, as SRE is not so much of this sort of sage magician role anymore, it used to be that what you would get in enterprises is typically a distributed SRE, someone that is sort of tasked with reliability across the entire enterprise or the organization, somebody that had sort of a legacy or strong understanding of the architecture that was in place. Increasingly, though, we're seeing what I would call the embedded SRE. This is someone who is really, uh, really looking to make sure that as you build in real time and who are responsible for building the real code, that telemetry really makes sense that you're building into your systems. Um, there are infrastructure SREs really focused on continuous integration and continuous deployment systems. And then there's the ones that are tool driven that you'll tend to see in bigger organizations. Uh, these are uh, engineers that are really meant to help and just set aside the monitoring and observability to help the engineers make the right decisions. And being as that I gave this talk to HashiCorp earlier today, um, I have left this uh, in because I think it's really interesting. If you're working with the HashiCorp stack at all, um, there was a really interesting talk a couple about a week and a half ago uh, called Fuzzing Nomad with Nomad, if you use Nomad. Um, so. Uh, I think it's an interesting talk because I'm going to talk today about uh, developing hypotheses and understanding why we make meaningful decisions about what we spin up. And this is another approach to solving the same problem that, you know, might eventually get to designing the right and choosing the most stable deployment, but you churn a lot of CPU in the process. Um, and I'm not saying that as a dig. They like this is something they acknowledge in the development of it. Um, so. If you are looking for another interesting and engaging talk in technical stacks right now, do check that one out for sure. And I'll share my slides after. Um, but today, let's focus in on SRE as a practice. We're going to be talking about monitoring and observability. When I'm talking about monitoring, it's just uh, being able to have the telemetry in your system, the process of recording the behavior of the system while you build, making sure that you are connected to your endpoints, you understand the way that your architecture is put together. Observability is a different thing. Now, I want to be pretty clear about what I'm talking about in observability in this case, mostly because I have had a lot of discussions recently with people who have been in this field for 10 years or more, and we're still having open discussions about having a shared understanding of the definition of observability. I kind of like this definition by Ernest Mueller, which is, uh, can we surface enough essentially to figure out what's actually going on? But I come from a signal process processing background um, and a cognitive engineering background, and I'm going to give us a much more specific definition to work with. Um, and this is why. Um, my first job before I ever got into hardcore software engineering or observing systems, my very first job was working with Boeing, and we were designing their Boeing uh, 737 cockpits. Now, 
a lot of people have this dream, this fantasy of being a cockpit and thinking about how beautiful it would be to be able to look out over the vast horizon, right? And that's great, that's a truth, but cockpits are actually designed so that you can surface the right information to understand the state of the aircraft, the, of the aircraft that you're within if there is zero visibility at all. So I think it's really interesting to understand what I'm talking about for monitoring versus observability in this sample. Let's talk about having a Grafana dashboard, right? What am I choosing to monitor? And what is the actual observability of the entire system that I'm getting out of the information that I'm provided. Because increasingly, the systems that we have are incredibly complex. We aren't just building monolithic architectures, we're building microservice architectures. And these have a, like, the wider these become, the more dependent they become on external systems, uh, the more we need to be able to observe and see the stability of them. So this is the definition that I'm going to use. I really would like this to become more standard. So I'm gonna define uh, observability as uh, what sort of encompasses this understanding. Um, everything that we build, even software, is it fundamentally observes the laws of thermodynamics. So even if I were to build a super stable monolith system, it will naturally decay. There will be moments where it spontaneously gives out. We're all software engineers. We understand that sometimes the system just stops and we don't know why. This is because of thermodynamics in some cases. In most cases, it's because I forgot to write a good test into my code. But if we do observability well, this is the definition I want us to use. Um, good observability is just simply defined as the signal processing of the state of a system that will continuously change with use and decay over time. For any of us that are in DevOps, I think this is a pretty good description of the kind of systems that we're trying to monitor. This is a really important question for me because, I mean, I think you're probably going to get from this talk, my background is not traditionally in SRE. I moved into SRE because um, I like to build really, really complex machine learning and AI systems that ask interesting questions about the world. And the uh, accuracy, the resolution of the questions that I'm asking is directly tied to the reliability of the DevOps structures underneath it. So as we start to build out these much more complex like ML and AI pipelines, this AI and ML operations is going to become more important um, because we're asking the kind of questions that we can't test deploy to be able to answer. We're sort of asking what is the best fuzzy maybe and then an unknown unknown as the other solution. Um, I'm not going to go into this uh, into this talk about some of the ideas that we have around helping to make your system more intelligent. I'm just going to leave up this slide, and I'd love to follow up with anyone that's really passionate about this. Um, I worked in a field where we were modeling uh, human cognition and actually finding out when can either a human or a system prove to have what we would call metacognition. So when are you right about being right and wrong about being wrong? And this is why when you're doing, you know, when you're switching to site reliability, engin reliability engineering from DevOps, if you really start to think about it as a way of mindfully testing and understanding and observing your system, uh, then we're not, you know, we're not fuzzing Nomad with Nomad anymore. We're actually saying we have a good reason to believe that this is what we want to deploy and test. So a little bit about the field at large, because, right, we're just talking about SRE on the cloud. Um, a little bit about where we're at. 64% um, of individuals that identified that in their workplace they're defined as SREs even those said that they worked in an organization that had been practicing uh, site reliability engineering for three years or less. So yeah, there's a couple of major players that have been doing this a long time and that are really good examples of good work for their environments. But a lot of people are just starting to get these systems into place. And it's such so much of a cultural and organizational shift that you really have to consider that it's, it's fresh the way that these people are working. Um, one of the things that I like to see is that 41% of people think that SREs and DevOps uh, are pretty much on the same team. I agree. I think the embedded SRE is the way to go. Third of you think it's complementary, and then a third of you also either don't know or think it's competitive. Let's prove that that is not the case. 
The one thing that did bother me from the most recent sort of SRE report was that even those that, you know, we've got SRE, the organization is formally practicing it, only about a third of those are actually still capturing error budgets. Uh, and I think that's really an issue because if you are capturing your error budgets, that's the bread and butter of doing SRE. It's kind of, in my view, the whole reason to do it. Um, so what exactly are error budgets? Uh, your error budget is simply the amount of error that a service can accumulate over a specified period of time before users grumble about the experience. So it actually has to be tied to what your end user is feeling and understanding about your app. It means that you can have failed requests and have them just re-upload. If they assume that it was their internet going out, that's great for you. That means that you can lower your availability for that and not impact the end user's experience. We're able to do SRE now because of the fundamental foundations of DevOps. I probably don't need to tell anybody on this uh, chat about you know, the basic tenets of DevOps, right? Bigger the silos, really fundamentally just, I would define that as the more lines of code you need to review the bug. If you have an inverse of that, smaller the changes, the faster the fix or the rollbacks. Um, but the difference between just doing DevOps and doing SRE, I think is the third. Like we agree now that we wanna make gradual and meaningful change to the developments that we do, but we need to have a systematic way for understanding what meaningful is. And that's what we're trying to do here. So when people ask me if SRE is just better monitoring and automation, the answer is kind of yes, but it's also absolutely not. Uh, because fundamentally, Everything falls under if it's if it's run by human beings under Conway's law, meaning that any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So in this case, right, if you start genuinely doing excellent telemetry in your service structure, your monitoring and automation puts the health of your services at the center of your business strategy and it really turns it around right this is like it is if you do sre really well it's like kind of impossible to ever have your business structure refall into a waterfall format like it literally is that you are thinking about the code as the fundamental reason for why you're building and it places the reality of the user experience at the center of your thinking from that. So really making sure that what is stable is what touches the end service. So if you haven't done SRE before, these are the three sort of metrics that are uh, pretty important to understand, but they're not that complex. Um, so everything that happens in SRE happens on the dimension of time. Um, and we can understand this through our SLIs, our SLOs, and our SLAs. Um, a service level indicator is just simply a statement saying X should be true. Um, so stating that a service should be available. Um, the second is a service level objective saying that X should be true Y percentage of time. So X should be available 99% of the time, for example. And then SLAs. We're not going to cover SLAs fundamentally because if you hit your SLAs and your SLOs and you stick within your error budget, those will never come into place. They're, they're just fiduciary and contractual agreements that are either B2B or B2C that you have, but if you exceed those, there will be consequences for, right? Fundamentally, if we're building stable enough systems and we're doing this well, that's never going to happen. So let's walk through a quick example of how we're going to build out an error budget. So in this case, let me say I want an SLO of 99.95% availability, right? This is why they say SRE is all about the nines. If I want to have an error budget for that, math is super complex for that. It literally, it's just one minus your service level objective. So what you have in this case, and then you sort of multiply that by uh, sort of the samples of time. So in reality right now, if I want to say I have an SLO of 99.95 for the availability of a service, that means that in real time, I am allowed or I'm allowing my system to have 21 minutes and 54 seconds for a calendar month of not being fully available to the end user, of being an interruption in my service. So if you incorporate these error budgets, it really does shift around the way that your entire organization will work because it starts to move to trust and to timely innovation um, because now everyone is going to be held back if you don't hit your error budgets, if you really have to go back and work on making your structures cleaner. 
Um, but I don't really want to scare you off, right? This is not, I think there is a belief that SRE is so hard because SREs are usually seen on pager duty solving the super hard problems, but that's like the worst case scenario. If you think about doing SRE as a predictive mechanism of a way to predict how your system will fail, you're in a much better place. So let's walk through doing this as just an iterative process. Um, you wanna automate, monitor, and then evolve your system. So we're gonna go through each set of these. If you're doing SRE for the first time, or if you just want to, you know, test this out on your own systems, it's best to just start with a like simple story of what you want to monitor. So tell the story with a couple of composite SLOs, two or more from different services that represent your end to end. You're going to want to lean on availability and on latency, but don't go more than about five for your initial dashboard or your initial understanding of your services. You want to have a human level understanding of your systems that you can continue to build the complexity onto, right? Sort of building that human in the loop until, you know, you can put ML or AI in the loop. The second is uh, to view these SLO, these objective violations as opportunities. They're just goals. And if you don't hit them, that's, you know, you don't want to have that as a continuous problem. But looking at the patterns of failures and successes over, say, a quarter allows you to have system level insights that you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, it allows you to do a level of abstracted pattern recognition um, that really helps to solve problems. I've made this one big. Uh, just in case any managers are in the room, because error budgets and blowouts are good. They're good things. Uh, when you put SRE into practice, right, or when you're trying to monitor these, when you're trying to hit these error budgets or avoid, you know, going into red on your budgets, uh, that's fine. The point is not to never fail. It's just to fail in a measurable way. And that's the fundamental improvement of doing SRE well. And that lets you communicate the big picture of what you're doing. It allows you to think about every time you've got a major uh, sort of feature delivery or a version change, go through and reevaluate your SLOs. Do they even make sense? You know, have you optimized in some way where, you know, you could either shorten and make that error budget tighter if you need to improve that experience? Or are you not seeing, you know, did you blow your error budget and you didn't get a single complaint from a single user? Maybe it's time to relax those requirements. Those are both good discussions to have. So if you work in this way, you're letting your development team spend their error budget in whatever way they feel. So that's in the prevention or the cure of system instabilities uh, when they need to do so. And then it's a good opportunity to move forward with features that gives you sort of a safety for failure, right? I think we're all familiar with sort of the fail forward mechanism, but SRE is really putting the tangible practices into place that sort of step that back and say, if we're going to put a system into place of accepting risk, how do we do that with observation? Um, if your question is, why isn't my team doing so already? I can tell you they probably are, right? So I am looking on most teams for that embedded SRE. I'm looking for the person or the individuals that never get paid to be on pager duty, but effectively have it, right? Those are your implicit SREs. They're the ones that really care about trying to make these services more stable. Um, and if you can use a couple of open source tools that make this pretty simple for you, um, you can start to just observe your system in real time. Last thing to say on this is that error budgets demonstrably balance the system stability with new development while keeping your user experience as the definition of good. If you really, really understand that about your error budgets, then you'll never make a stupid one, right? You'll never make one that doesn't make sense. You just want to have something that sort of counts down, ties to the grumbling of your users so that they eventually go silent because they're experiencing enough goodness from your app, enough delight from the new features that you're providing that you're continuously able to grow. So DevOps engineers, I have something that I think you're going to be excited about, and it is called Reliably. Um, so this is a free and open source uh, product that we're uh, building out right now, my whole team. Um, if you want to use it to test out your Kubernetes deployments or to fit it into your CICD pipeline, you can do that. It's a pretty simple uh, service to set up. Um, I work on the product strategy for this, and one of my sort of personal rules for my own attention span is uh, to try to get things up and running in five minutes or less. 
So to keep this talk short and to show you running these things in five minutes or less, let's go through an example of defining and monitoring the SLOs and SLIs. So remember that we're setting up an error budget is just one minus the SLO. So if I wanted to make one of these on my computer right now, how would I go ahead and do that? Uh, I think the last note on this, uh, so this was talking at HashiCorp today, considering the fact that a lot of us are now building out multi-cloud, or at least considering building multi-cloud, and I think this is a really good point. Um, you probably, you should be checking your SLOs across your different uh, service, your service, your different cloud providers. Um, they have different levels of availability and that affects the entire availability of your system because they are dependent on them on each other and your SLOs can also have interdependencies. Um, it's not that hard to sort of figure out, though, as long as you just think about it in a straightforward way. So I have just downloaded the Reliably product into a file structure uh, where I've got my deployments and I'm just going to do SLO init. It's going to ask me a set of questions that allow me to declare exactly how I want my SLOs and my SLIs to be set up. And this will connect directly to my telemetry. So, you know, what is my cloud provider? What's the ARN for this uh, AWS? Um, do I want to add anything else to it? Right? In 30 seconds, I've just created an SLO from the command line that I am now able to track moving forward. So let's set up another one real quick. So now we're going to set up an SLO straight from the command line that allows us to uh, check our latency. We're going to say exactly what our estimate is for that. And then we're going to add in the resource for it. In this case, we're going to lean on the Google Cloud platform. Um, as soon as you have these set up, you're in a really beautiful place because you don't have to get these right right away, right? It's a process of evolution. It's a process of experimentation. As long as you have these into place, you immediately start asking the question, should we be changing these? So start to think about it, you know, again, still on the dimension of time. So let's look at a simple report of running this service in real time. I'm getting a readout now that shows me what are the SLOs that I'm trying to hit? What are the SLIs underneath those? And you know, how well am I doing at my system health of actually approaching reliability in my code? Um, so if you are interested in keeping these totally aligned, um, there's a lot of interesting things you can do just by setting these up in this way. Uh, a couple of call to actions. Uh, I am going to sort of finish up this talk and give us a lot of time to really talk with the panelists as well. Um, if you're really interested in this idea of how we're extending observability to AI and ML, I am super passionate about this. I would love to talk to you about that and save it for another talk. It's a whole own topic. Uh, but before I finish, I was reminded today, um, I, I gave the example of the cockpits and in HashiCorp, there were a couple of other pilots. I myself am a pilot. That is why I have so many aviation examples. Um, but I want to take a step back to think about where we are as developers, as DevOps engineers, working in a cloud native environment these days, right? Um, and there's an example about early digital transformation that I think is great and really like brings down the point of why we need SRE and why we need to work on these problems. Um, sort of the transformation from legacy systems to cloud platforms, right? What is a similar big shift that has happened in the past? And a little over 50 years ago, there was the shift in aviation from propeller-based aviation to jets. Um, and one of the first uh, Boeing uh, test pilots for jet airplanes was this guy named Tex Johnson. He would wear cowboy boots when he did his uh, test runs. And he had a sign uh, at his workplace in Boeing that said, one test is worth a thousand opinions. Now this guy is a hero of mine because he took an aircraft that had literally never been flown before. No one had ever flown an aircraft like this, a giant jet aircraft. And the first flight, he not only did one barrel run, but two barrel rolls in an aircraft where no one had even flown it on a fixed wing. 
Now, if you don't think that's relevant right away, what about this? Right now, we're looking at examples of like Amazon Prime and Disney Plus that are deploying things that we have never ever tested the size or complexity of. You yourself are probably building systems that you know we've just never seen these types of architectures and the nuance of the way that you're creating it before. It's hard to have information transfer there, but it is interesting for us to think that as engineers and developers, we are both creating the uh, aircraft, we're designing the cockpit to observe it, and we're also flying these. We're trying to get these to deploy and to be stable. Um, so that's just a point of reflection on my side. Um, a couple of things that I'd love to follow up with, uh, with anyone in this group, if you're interested, um, you can look up and understand some of the SRE automation that we're building into Reliably at reliably.com. Uh, that pairs super well with Chaos Engineering, and you can use the open source toolkit, uh, Chaos Toolkit, uh, that uh, can really help you to understand when is the good time to make a good experiment and when's the right time to sort of build into robustness. Um, We've got a team of incredibly smart interns at Reliably, and we're working on some interesting topics. Uh, my pitch to you is if you can follow either or both of these tiny URLs, slash cognitive SRE and slash tech stack SRE, I have a couple of interns who are doing survey studies around this field. If I do get your response and I get your email out of it, I will send you the O'Reilly book of your choice, although the O'Reilly book of my choice, if you don't have a preference, it's going to be Kubernetes patterns. Um, if you are interested in all of the fun buzzwords, uh, we did just complete a demo on chaos engineering for blockchain. Um, and I think it's a really, really interesting example of having to understand your architecture, really understand fundamentally the systems that you're building in order to experiment well with them, right? Um, because one test is uh, worth a thousand opinions. Um, that's it on my side. So I'm gonna let go of my screen, but before I do, I just wanna say, I let all of the organizers know that if there were any particularly hard questions, I would definitely reserve those for the other panelists. So uh, I just wanna make sure I make that point. I will uh, stop sharing now. Thank you so much. Excellent, Sal. Um, yeah, other panelists, don't worry too much. <laughs> don't worry, I'll intervene, I'll answer them. So the, the, the answer is um, 42, everyone knows that. Um, yeah, excellent talk. Thank you so much, Sal. Um, uh, everybody, if you just want to uh, open your video, open up your mics and uh, give Sal a little round of applause. It doesn't really work so well on Zoom, but you kind of get the idea. So yes, thank Yay. you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Sarah, is your slide deck going to be available somewhere? Yeah, I'll definitely make it available. I'll put it right on the comments of the meetup. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Um, okay, did anyone have any questions specifically um, for Sal? Not too hard ones? No, well, I have a hard one, which is how do you convince senior management this is the right way to go? Say that again. <laughs> how do you convince senior management that this is the right way to go? <laughs> um, honestly, it's an interesting question, right? I think... I, there, I'm just going to say this straight, right? There's companies where SRE is never going to happen and that's totally fine, but like they might not be around in 10 years. That's my point of view. Um, I think a lot of things are shifting cloud native or in that transition are fundamentally accepting that tech is, you know, it's not something to be talked down to. It's something to be considered a peer in the business relationship. Um, and I think SRE really helps with that. So in the next management meeting, I tell them they won't be there in a few years, and that's going to get me what I want, right? No, <laughs> it's a career-limiting move. Come up with something better. No, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's a career-limiting move. Um, let me see. I, well, let me ask you this question. Why would you choose not to implement SRE, Andrew? But I'm not the management. I want to do okay. this. Okay. I think Andrew's saying that, um, that they won't still be there. <laughs> um, I think basically Andrew Hardy is going to outlive us all anyway um, in this in this world. So, um, Oi. You know. <laughs> hey, I'm giving you a compliment, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other questions to Sal specifically? No. Uh, Hamad, accessible requirements. Not sure that's quite on topic, Hamad. Not sure. Um, let's pick that one off offline. Um, 
and uh, let's see where we can go with that. All right, so um, let's uh, let's move on and let's introduce um, our panelists. Um, we've got two other panelists to um, to hopefully have a little chat about SRE and how it relates to DevOps, all those sort of things. Um, so I'd first, we'd like to introduce. Um, Ian Ree from, from IG, um, who works with um, Hamid Silitani, um, who I'm sure many of you will remember, who's given some awesome talks um, to this group, um, two or three now, I think. Um, so, um, so, so Ian is here um, to represent the, the SRE um, function um, um, in, inside of IG. Yep. Um, Ian, are you there? Did you want to just uh, introduce here. yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm Ian Ray. Um... I am an SRE at um, IG. I have been for a couple of years. Before that, I was a team lead for a middleware um, team in, in IG. And before that, I joined IG as a senior dev. So I've been in development for quite a while. And I've done quite a lot of different things. So from requirements gathering to you know delivery. Um, so I have experienced quite a bit. And I, for me, SRE is all about stability, security, and observability. Okay, cool. Um, some good points to, to, to start us off there. Um, so I'll try and remember those. Um, and let me also introduce uh, David, David Stark, um, who again, um, a fairly uh, regular attendee, both of uh, uh, London DevOps, uh, DevOps Exchange, all those sort of things. And um, David's also spoken um, at London DevOps in the past. I think we were up at Secret Escapes um, up in Holborn, um, opposite the Sainsbury's office when you spoke. David, do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is David. I've been in the business now probably 20 odd years. Started in the data center. So I'm kind of a natural SRE. Um, that's about it, really. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And where are you working now? It's um, uh, I think it's Doddle. I'm working which, at Doddle now. Yeah. Which um, I, I've been there about a year. We got confused with the with the thing where you do polls, which is Doodle. Um, so sorry about that. Um, My cool. most common typo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. So let's kick it off. Um, so just uh, a little bit on rules and regulations of this section. Um, well, actually, there are, there kind of really aren't any. Um, we um, uh, I'll um, I'll step in if we get into ground that is a little is too difficult um, based on um, uh, the criteria as I understand them, um, where people are comfortable. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable in the chat. Um, so don't worry about any of that. Um, I know um, this audience is very good at throwing curveball questions, um, but if you do want to ask something, then um, please do either ask it in the chat there um, or kind of come off mute at an appropriate um, point. Um, it'll be good to get people involved um, in this section. Um, uh, not that we don't welcome involvement in the in the other sections, um, but most of all, this is a good opportunity to not just have a faceless webinar. Oh, David's on the brew dog already. I approve. Um, uh, not just a faceless webinar, so please do come out, come out, come up, um, come off mute, ask some questions, and uh, let's get some discussion going. Um, so yeah, I'll um, I've I've got some sample questions that I've kind of come up with in the last couple of hours, and also while uh, while Sal was, was was talking, and I'd like to ask you all, um, and feel free to just start talking um, about this um, stuff um, around. Um, we we talk about. Um, Andrew kind of pref uh, prefaced this a little bit uh, around, you know, how do you actually, you've decided SRE is a good idea. You want to do some SRE, um, you're at our level or maybe above or below. Um, and you start going in to talk to people about things like error budgets. And they're saying, yeah, but actually we shouldn't have errors. No, things should be up all the time. Um, how do you start broaching those sort of conversations with, uh, with the higher ups when you're trying to get this sort of thing off the ground? Great question, actually. But I think like uh, that 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 sort of falls into where DevOps was maybe five or six years ago, right? Like there were there was this movement, and there were a whole bunch of new words and a a whole bunch of people who 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 didn't really want to know. I think there's a there's there's there is there is conflict around the decision whether or not that should be led from top down or bottom up. But I think most people would agree that that both is better. Um, obviously, the there's a there's a thing they talk about where they talk about it from the C level, you know, so the CEO, CFO, you know, all the sort of C people should be sort of saying, let's let's do it, let's let's embrace this X culture. I think um 
I think that the, the hardest thing is to dispel the myth around whether or not SRE are mutually exclusive, because there's a lot of people who actually still think that 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 it is. Um, but uh, I don't know if that answers anyone's questions. I feel like uh, I'll, I'll give someone else a, a moment to say That's something. That's good, David. Yeah, thank you for, for, for opening on that one. Um, Ian, uh, any, any thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I would take a slightly different tack, I think. Um, so one of the, the chief things about SRE is learning from outages and incidents and events. Um, you know, it, it's very natural for companies to fix a problem and then move on. And I think um, it's a sign of maturity if you actually go back and have a look and try and decide, you know, if you can learn from this, this problem that occurred. I mean, you've, you've, you've spent money fixing it. You may as well get something from that and go back and try and learn as much as you can from that incident knowledge. And, and the thing is, is also, um, it's an opportunity. It, it's shown you how your system can fail. And there may have been many contributing factors. So this idea of, you know, a single point of failure is probably not true. You probably had a single point of ignition, but lots of failures that just happened to come together all in one go and caused you a catastrophic problem. Um, and I think that, that 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 is kind of the argument you want to give to management that, you know, SRE is, is a way of accepting failure, learning from it, and trying to produce more stable software. Yeah, it's it's definitely a core tenant, isn't it? Like it that it's it's just it's just accepted that it's part of it, and we're going to make budgets. Like, yeah. I I, th I find I find it really hard sometimes. Some sometimes when people quite they, they don't understand when you're talking about budgets, and and then you'll realize that we've just been here before. We've we've had outages before. We we're just we're just predicting it now. We we accept that it's going to happen. You know, it's like no one's broken cap theorem yet. You know, <laughs> like, it's going to happen. So let's let's plan for it. You know, and at the same time, it, it it only increases the the look of your company when you're speaking with somebody else and you're actually talking about the amount of nines that you can deliver. Um, mm. And I think that the part of part of the the philosophy about SRE is that that it 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 by design it it really it 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 forces the developers and the ops and the sales and everyone to to at some point actually talk about the same language like the i just like that there are defined words and a scientific manner which which lets you work it doesn't mean that it's not devops it doesn't mean that there's nobody who who can't switch departments or there's 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 no exceptions it just means that there there is a way to measure stuff and i i enjoy that yeah, I think I'm going to jump in real quickly on that. I think that's the main point. Like I, I've seen this culturally, people trying to put it into place and like you just like culturally can't start having SRE until you have monitoring, right? And then the second you have that, you can start to have a real conversation. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to have the dashboard in place before you can start to even say what the value is for your specific system. So yeah, I think... Uh... I'm ashamed of how few budget burn down graphs I have at the moment, but I've got a few, at least. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a journey. I think it's just everybody has to go that way, you know, like eventually you'll get there. It is a maturity thing. There are organizations which are not ready. They 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 don't have include here, whatever it is, but like it's not, it's not always technical. It, it could always just be that they have a, a technically consistent environment, but a, a culture of people who who hold on to problems and don't share them. It's no different from the typical DevOps issues. So I think I think that like I feel like we're talking really about culture change, which is again one of the biggest pains of probably most people's existence. Cause because we, we have the holy land where we all want to be. <laughs> and then we have yeah. where we are. It seems it, it crosses over quite nicely with um um almost surfacing some of these things that were previously like guilty secrets um and uh, legitimizing that and um, allowing people to you know accept that yes failure is going to happen um ian you mentioned um you know this crossover into a world where you've got failures that happen due to multiple factors and um it makes me think of like john Orspore, sydney decker the you know the, the sort of work that they do mm -hmm. um 
in analyzing um, outages and, and root causes if, if such a thing exists. Sorry, that means the sweet potatoes are cooked. Um, and, um, and, and, and yeah, it's almost like it's adding some more psychological safety to your organization by making these things acceptable. Um, d d is that something that resonates with, with, with you guys and girls? Yeah, I think that psychological safety is like, we're really starting to get to the main point, right? It's uh, like, if we're just straight up about it, this looks a lot like the cognitive engineering of DevOps, right? That's all it is. It literally is not a different job. It's just thinking about the way that we design our goals differently and then wrapping that systematically. That's kind of my view. I think it's tricky sometimes because I've been, in, I was a, at a place once where we were we were introducing DevOps and and this was mind you a few years back and so they had this team of the sort of classic sysadmins and then they they got rebranded as DevOps and and each one of them was this insane silo of knowledge that was not documented anywhere and um and I, I mean I don't know if anyone's familiar with the word toil but that's what they did <laughs> um so so that that's sort of like that they just logged into servers, they rebooted them, and they walked away, <laughs> and, and that, that's what they kind of did all day. And 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 uh, it wasn't because they were like malicious or evil or anything like that. It was just what they did, and they'd been doing it for ten years. And and uh, you know, it's it was like there's no difference between if you're trying to get someone to move to a better place, they will actually come along willingly because they'll see the advantage to to just sitting back and doing nothing rather than having to to actually manually do work all the time um but i think i think i think the the the, the lesson i learned there was that the, is that is that kind of kind of the the process of of making people think differently very much relied on on just having some graphs <laughs> like uh it, it's a it's re reliably efficient like I think I think with SRE the thing I I really like is just just that they the graphs aren't just like hey lots of things there's that you can have the indicator which is like yes no like it's a binary like you're you're either up or you're down you've got a problem or you don't and and it it makes it very easy to 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 understand if something needs to happen I uh yeah. I think uh, so does that then um um, sorry, you made a few points there. I didn't want to uh, lose <laughs> any of them. Um, I'll let you finish in a minute. Um, the, does, does that mean that um, you know, coming back to the you know, this is happening to just you know, IT crowd style, just turn things off and on again. Um, uh -oh. Is it the case that having um, having an SRE mentality is legitimising um, uh, not just doing that? And if you pull apart, why are they doing that? It's because well, actually. Um, maybe the organization doesn't support um, them in fixing things properly. Maybe, you know, all the developers are too busy writing new code and new functions that to, to worry about the reliability of the old stuff. Um, and also, so it's just the quickest way. Um, and it, it seems like um, part of what we're doing with SRE um, is um, to debunk that and to say, yes, um, we, we can't aim for 100% uptime. Um, I'll, whilst our, our meantime to return to service is, is important, um, you know, we're going to give us a little, a little space um, mm. to be able to investigate things and fix them properly and take things down so we can re-engineer them. Um, is, that, is, is that something that resonates with other people? I don't think I don't anyone's going to disagree. No, I don't Sorry. think so either. As, as, all I was going to say was I think... Um, the, the move to SRE actually puts the user first. And mm. it's very easy as a dev team to just think about your little world, um, you know, your, your little microservice or set of microservices. And then that, that, that becomes, you know, you're, you're testing that, you're, you, that, that's how you live. But from an SRE point of view, you're actually talking about, well, what's acceptable to the user in terms of latency? What's acceptable to the user in terms of downtime? How much downtime are users going to accept, which was in, in the talk, and is actually a very important part of, you know, how much error can users tolerate and can we quantify it? And then this, this then 
this actually goes back to the very first bit that Andrew was asking about how, how do you know managers get to this and it and it really is well what service are you offering to your clients you know your clients are choosing your product instead of a competitor's yeah. why and it, it presumably it's something to do with cost performance reliability you know and these these are exactly yeah. the sort of things that, that that fall into this sort of sre umbrella yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just a really good point. I'm seeing in the messages here, right? Something that all of us have heard before. And it says, aren't we setting ourselves up for failure already if we're not targeting tens, <laughs> right? Like, but I think what's really important to understand and I think making things surfaced and observable to those that aren't traditionally inside of the stack or the DevOps is there are mathematical limitations to the nines that you can get. That's why it's so important to surface and visualize. And when I'm telling you that there are dependencies between SLOs, those are mathematical, right? If one service is less available and another service is dependent on that, that's what you have to really understand. And I think it makes those conversations with management a lot easier when you're literally just saying, all right, here are the numbers and here's, right? It's, it's not about the nines. It is about what is experienced by your user in that case. I mean, from a, sort of, a ring of holisticness to it, really, isn't it? I was going to say, from a joking oh, yeah. point of view, I always say that data centers like a perfect implementation of Murphy's Law. You know, <laughs> if something's going to go wrong, you know, your data center is going to be on fire. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's true. You know, there's so many switches, so many components. Each one has a probability of failure. You're never going to reach tens for any long length of time. You know, the world of physics is against you. It's unattempted. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a theory that Google broke it once, uh, but but the, there were some white papers published about how they didn't because they cheated with a, a highly available network and all that. And it's like you, you just can't do it. <laughs> like no one can do it, and it's okay. Like like I feel like any practical person knows this, right? Um, but sometimes it is intriguing because because sometimes I would I would actually say even with Google and AWS and all of those big players their their highest cause of outage is is uh, configuration human misconfiguration and uh, I think if if with that in mind you know you're you're not trying to over engineer spaceships to to go and do strange things and land on the Mars or whatever like. Like we're actually just trying to make things holistic and simple. Like, I, like it's the same as DevOps. Like, you know, release frequently, and do things in small bits, so you can test all the time. So you can always know that 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 little release wasn't massively catastrophic, and and you know, it's the same kind of thing. Like, it's it's an agile friendly philosophy. I think I think that Google kept the word SRE and the philosophies quite quite secret saucy, you know, for a while. Um, uh, and and whilst they were doing that, you know, the sort of DevOps movement happened um, because you know cloud was happening, and and you know Ansible and Chef and Puppet and all these things were taking off, and and uh, like those two philosophies, like what's that? What's that? That phrase with the the uh, uh, from from SRE import DevOps. You know, it's it's you see it sort of repeated in different places. There are a lot of people who would greatly disagree with it but you know it, it's it's as i just i just see it as a sort of more superset version where you actually have words like budgets like a it's fairly sensible relatively you know cool thank you uh david um yeah do we want to pick up on that the, the intersection um of devops and sre um i mean andrew um andrew had you mike is i'll ask a question um around, you know, do we think DevOps and SRE are converging? Um, I know Sal talked about the different patterns, for example, embedded SREs and the other three, which I've forgotten, sorry. Um, is it, what do we think is the right model there? Um, I'll leave it there. Well, it's hard enough to define DevOps, right? Some people think it's a title, <laughs> yeah. some people think it's a way of behavior. Good point. Um, and al al although I would say it's easier to define SRE because it is defined, it's a science. And, and it is just engineering. So 
that's the 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 appeal and the ease and the value of using it and it doesn't need to well it just you can't really do it without the other the the, the methodology of devops is compatible with it and, and agile and, and and so forth excellent Ian, any thoughts on that no no i'm not going with that I, I would completely agree that it's compatible i mean i would be i mean i'm surprised that anybody thinks that they're not and they're in competition because they really shouldn't be I mean, S yeah, SRE. These fights on Reddit. <laughs> the, the, the role of SRE is just is is only to try and make the life of users, you know, acceptable, and to keep the company going. Uh, DevOps is to keep those services up and running and, and deliver new services. I and mean, what was touched upon briefly in in the slides was um, SLOs. I and mean, I see SLOs as being a way of indicating where you need to spend time on on maintenance and where you can put your foot down and start delivering even more change. And as you start burning up your error budgets, you might decide you want to take your foot off from releasing too much new code into your data center or uh, you know into, into Kubernetes. And you might want to focus on bringing back those um, numbers back into line with, with your expectation. I, I honestly think it's it's complementary. I, I don't see that they're in competition at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they shouldn't be. Another way to another way to look at it, right, is like SREs are really helping to make sure that we're doing we've got the right inputs to do revenue per developer at a really fundamental organizational large point of view. Like, are we building in a way that means that we can just move forward with the progress we've made, make features that delight people? but that are stable enough to continue to move forward. Um, if you don't build in that way, right? Like, I mean, the view is in my point of view, without SRE, if we continue to do DevOps the way that we had been doing it, maybe five closer to 10 years ago, that was just representational of the complexity of the kind of systems that we had. We didn't need to have this sort of complexity of monitoring because things weren't decaying. They weren't as complex things are only becoming more complex. And if you're hosting on the cloud, you're tying into systems that you fundamentally don't have baseline control over. Um, so it's increasingly necessary. Um, and yeah, they are the same. They can and should, in my point of view, I'd love for them to be seen as literally the same people. Um, so right. that is my bias. I'll go with that. Thank you, Sal. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I'd like to just pull back to um, uh, one of your points, which is, a, which is about introducing as much simplicity or removing complexity. Um, and yeah, that's another aspect to it. The, the services we're consuming on Amazon, on Google Cloud, et cetera, are uh, increasingly complex. Um, and, and thus, if we're not going to get in a mess, um, it makes absolute sense to, to make, them, make, make, make our stuff as simple as possible. Um, I mean, after all, that's part of the, part of the reason why we're, you know, why, why they're taking Amazon's RDS instead of Putting up an EC2 instance and installing Postgres or some other inferior database on it. Um, right, let's um, let's drop to some of the other questions. Um, so Peter Peter Dorgovitis, um, my colleague and friend, thank you, um, has contributed a, a question here, which are which is um, what do you think are the the hard and fast prerequisites for SRE? Um, and how do you walk before you run? Um, if you're going into an organisation and thinking, yeah, we kind of want to do SRE. Um, but we can't until we've done this or that. Um, that might be firing the entire management, but I don't know. Any thoughts on that from any of the panel? Uh, I'll start that off. Um, I, th I think it's really hard to define all of the prerequisites, but I, I guess the bare minimum would be absolutely from the bottom, you need some people who are willing to do that work. And, and I mean, a cross-functional team, not like, you know, a bunch of sysadmins in a corner, because the part of the philosophy with, with SRE is that, say, 20% of, of each SRE's time is going to be spent writing code and hanging out with the devs. And because when, when you're within budget, you, you are encouraged to go and be free, a free agent to go and work in other teams and explore and find out what's going on and, and integrate. And, and that's the dream. <laughs> uh, but to a degree, like they even encourage SREs to switch organizations frequently. Um, but a lot of this is, uh, you know, 
philosophical, <laughs> but um, you know, realistically, you, you need the buy-in from the bottom and you need the buy-in from the top. And the buy-in from the top is actually, I would say, well, I, I can't speak for everyone's management, but you you can probably sell it quite well when you when you point out that that you can reduce the amount of alert fatigue, you can reduce the the amount of hiring devs versus ops because actually, you know, if if that that ops guy is doing a good job, uh, then he doesn't need to be an ops and he can just go and be a dev for uh, Tuesdays or something. And so, you know, if if the devs aren't aren't responding to their requirements and their budgets and the thing's broken and they're not fixing it and they're just releasing features rather than than bringing the bringing it back under the budget, then then the SREs will just come to them and say, well, here's the pager, like we're done, enjoy it. And and that team suddenly realizes at 2 a.m. that they need to be fixing their code rather than 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 writing features. And and that's that's the philosophy. It's 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 very actually economically efficient and it's also beneficial to the customer. And so when you say saving money and better product and better delivery, and it's holistically good, you know, well. I'm not sure how you can describe holistically good. <laughs> but point them with some fancy YouTube videos. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, um, Ian, any thoughts on um, prerequisites? Um, I mean, there's obviously needs to be a desire um, to recognise that that things could be better, um, and maybe this is one one avenue of worthy of going down. I mean, I think it's already been said that, you know, this possibly isn't for every organization. I mean, I think in reality, it, it, it ought to be for every organization, but not every organization has the management buy-in that this would work. Um, and obviously, you, do, you don't want um, your SRE function just to be continuously fighting fires with management or development. You kind of you need to have buy-in from both. I mean, you know, yeah. I, th I think that is true. You absolutely need both. Probably uh, realistically yeah. top down more efficiently, more 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 importantly, I think. Sounds I mean, like um for sorry going in. I was gonna say where, where we kind of started in IG was um the SRE function was looking primarily at difficult problems, and and was looking at you know you know outages or incidents or near misses and really digging into problems, and that that's kind of where we started. Uh, we already had some um, dashboards, so we're using things like App Dynamics and Splunk. Um, so we already had some some sort of ideas around kind of metrics, um, but you know, IG is is very much um, still still progressing, still learning. Um, we're still pushing. Um, you know, we still got a long way to go. Um, it's interesting. And I think this this sort of group is interesting as well because you know we're all we're all at different points on that cycle, um, and you know if you think about where Chaos Monkey and Chaos Gorilla and all those things were, how many years ago from Netflix, you know even just the realm of chaos has moved quite dramatically and become more nuanced than than that original work, um, and you know we are at a point where we can make quite big strides standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were. Excellent, good. Never a better time to uh, quote Oscar Wilde, is it? Cool. Um, so, um, Aparna um, has got a question about burn rates. Um, is it a good idea to alert only on burn rates, considering noise reduction is another objective of SRE? Who wants to tackle that one? No. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Even even like you need to be pragmatic, just like like being a DevOps. There are some things that you need to know about immediately. Uh, end of story. Yeah, I agree. It, it's interesting and it's something you should work on, but you don't need to be alerted about it immediately. You need to know I about it. I suppose you could argue that it's contextual, right? Maybe maybe a person's only responsible for a small sliver of a, a cake and and maybe it's acceptable with that, but it's entirely your judgment, I, I would say. You know, the, just the domain knowledge of the people who know what those delights are. Like, don't ask me. <laughs> yeah. 
There you go. That that good. That's, that's a fairly uh, a comprehensive um, um, answer to that one. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, didn't need to be comprehensive. No. All right. Good. So, um, Mark, um, yeah, uh, so we touched on some of this stuff already, um, but in, in terms of like DevOps maturity, do you, do you think there's a level of DevOps maturity that um, that you kind of need to make the most out of SRE? That, that's actually quite hard as well, because it, it I, I would say it's all right. It, it really it's true, obviously there there, but like there's just discrepant levels of DevOps maturity everywhere. So let's let's quite and let's let's decide, dissect it slightly. So so you can have DevOps maturity in terms of organizational behavior and awareness, and do the product people understand that that they're doing agile and not waterfall like that kind of DevOps maturity, and then and then. And then it maybe to the question, I'm guessing is more like, are the people who are the DevOps, are, are they uh, bored and everything's okay and automated and they're, they've got no problems, then yeah, <laughs> like maybe moving towards something where they have better measurements is great. I, I don't really understand how to dissect that without, you know, sort of more, knowing more about what type of DevOps maturity we mean, you know, it's, it's super, Play. Yeah. super subjective. Yeah. Right? I guess it's um, stuff around um, uh, if you've got an organization that's only able to release software once a quarter, um, you, you're going to have a hard time making much, uh, much impact on um, improving um, reliability in, in that world, I guess. Um, those sort of things uh, seem to come to mind for me. Um, yeah, and, and that's exactly the question, right? It's, as you know, at least in my opinion, DevOps is mostly about the processes and people. So in that sense, what kind of, what would be the pre-requirements of SRE for those processes? Would SRE be a requirement, for example, for uh, micro applications would be a requirement for SRE? So that's the kind of thing, right? What would be the minimum things that you need in order to build a good SRE practice? Because I said, if you try to build it on top of an AS400 with no monitoring, um, it won't work. Yeah, cool. All right, um, Ian, uh, Sal, any other thoughts on, on that aspect? No, I mean, a couple of things that I think about I, uh, you know, talking to a lot of people in this field, I mean, we can say like somewhere between like eight and 10% of enterprises are doing, you know, DevOps, but like what percentage of them are doing like DevOps, CI, CD, and like, do they mean it? <laughs> right. Um, so that's kind of the difference in the levels of maturity that you can have from my point of view. Um, and I think that's interesting, right? We touched a little bit on chaos engineering. I thought it was really fascinating. Like AWS has put so much effort into building out that really, really cool uh, fault injection simulator so that you can go through and do this like complex testing of your system. However, you can only use that tool if you actually have CI CD in place. So that really limits their market. Um, Conversely to that, I think you absolutely can do site reliability engineering at any phase of your development, right? Like I could think as a solo developer building out an application, I could think in an SRE way. Um, so I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's just thinking differently in a, in a kind of fundamental sense. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of nuance there. That's a, it's a whole discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Okay, good. All right, we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time now. So um, we'll probably wrap up. Um, Joe, thank you. Isaac Newton standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm thinking of, um, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking in the stars, which is Oscar Wilde. So apologies for being terrible no, no, remembering no, those references. That was Winston Churchill. Was it? <laughs> oh, I'm just digging a hole for myself now. I'm going to stop going down this route and pretending to be even vaguely cultured. I'll go back to my Kubernetes cluster. Right. Okay. We're about done. <laughs> oh, you could be actually. Yeah, no, you're wrong. No, no, I'm sure you're right. Um, <laughs> let's just wrap up there. Um, thank you to to everyone. Um, I just want to give everyone just a, um, a, an opportunity for any any closing thoughts if you if you wanted some. Um, start with Ian. Did you, anything anything you feel we haven't covered that you wanted to, to mention at all? Or? 
Oh, there's lots of things we haven't covered. Um, but <laughs> um, no, it's great. Um, I think it was a really interesting talk. Um, and I'll probably go and watch it again, actually. Great. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Ian. Cool. Uh, David, anything from you? Uh, I, I, I've just been uh, bugging me because somebody was talking about um, alerts and I was thinking about saying it and I didn't. Um, but one of the, the sales pitches, perhaps, that you can use to your DevOps team or who, whomever is that um, you can actually reduce the amount of uh, alert spam that they get um, with their survey practices. And, and that, that's a lot of that sort of being practical and pragmatic. So, for example, instead of just alerting on when you're running out of disk on things, you could actually say, well, you know, what, we've got two of those and it's HA and we'll just fix it in the morning. So you can actually get rid of those because you're more worried about the real thing. Like, is it down? So you can um, you can actually make life better for everybody. That's a good sales pitch, generally. Excellent. I must confess, um, I just Googled that quote. It was Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh. you, David. <laughs> uh, Sal, anything to, to um, from you to, to close off on? It's like Jerry Springer's final thought. <laughs> no, um, if, uh, if you want to be in touch, absolutely get in touch with me and I'm happy to follow up with any questions. This is like, right, these are, we're asking interesting questions where there's definitely more than one answer to the way that you can model these solutions. And that's a really cool place to be. So happy to talk more with anyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to say thank you to, to all the panelists. Again, if you want to come on video off of mute and do the applause type thing, everyone, um, please do. So thank you to Ian Ray, to David Stark, and most especially to, to Sal Kimmich. So thank you. <laughs> it never works. The, the thoughts there. Um, okay, so um, yeah, that's it really. Um, so just mopping up a few other little things. Um, Ari's just reminded everyone of the, the Swamp Up conference pass. I've signed up for that. I'm hoping to be able to attend a few of those talks. Um, Mark's also pointed out that the DevOps Institute are running an SRE day. Um, uh, unfortunately, on the same day as um, one of the, either the JFrog event or the um, uh, the Container Solutions event, but again, uh, well recommended. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention. Um, uh, what was it? Oh yes. Um, so in a rare um, in, in, in a rare uh, occurrence of us being organised, um, we already know when our next meetup is going to be and what the subject is going to be. Um, so we're going to be talking about CI/CD um, with um, uh, with Ari's colleague. Um, uh, Bettel, who will be talking about um, CICD and GitHub Actions in, in Azure, and that's going to be probably on June the 15th. Um, so yes, meetup number 62, we're already, uh, um, we're already, already planned for that. Engage smug face. So that's it from us, really. I think, um, please let us know what you thought, if you enjoyed the meetup um, or otherwise. Um, uh, Sal's just putting another link, um, SREs and SLO, oh, SLO Conf. So is that a whole conference on service level objectives? It is, and it's pre-recorded. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's I, you know, I haven't seen all the speakers for it yet, but that's I think next week. Um, it's free if you're interested. Go do it. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, so that's it. Yeah, thank you everyone to, uh, for coming, um, uh, spending your, your evenings on Zoom with uh, with us. I'm I'm sure uh, many of us are, are completely zoomed out, so it makes it doubly impressive that um, that you've uh, lasted till the end. So thank you, Hamad. You're absolutely right. Pizza time. Um, couldn't agree more. Can't wait to share a slice with you um, in the real world and you, Hardy. Um, so that's it. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to panelists. Thank you to Sal for speaking. Um, thank you to the co-organizers, the sponsors, etc. Blah 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 blah. Uh, we'll see you again in about a month. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got lots of reading and lots of conferences to go to. Um, but that's it for now. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, Good night. Everyone. See you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.